Humidity is the next subject we will be covering. We all have experience with humidity. Humid days are described as thick or moist, sticky. And when the temperature rises, they can be fairly miserable. As outlined in the prelude to the reading, high temperature with high relative humidity can make the heat index skyrocket. 130 degrees Fahrenheit as reported on April 26, 2005 in Thailand. Now that is hot. In general, humidity refers to the amount of water vapor in the air. There are several ways to measure humidity and we will learn about different concepts related to humidity. First, we will link humidity to large-scale processes and then move on to the smaller features of humidity and water vapor. The hydrologic or water cycle model describes the path of water as it moves through the Earth's system. Some of these processes are likely familiar to you. Evaporation is the movement of water from liquid to a gas, condensation from a gas to a liquid, and precipitation, the movement of water, solid or liquid, to the surface. Transpiration is the movement of water through the plants. Runoff is the movement of water over the surface. And infiltration is the movement of water into the ground to form groundwater. Note also that water can be stored in different reservoirs. Water can be stored in oceans, in rivers, in lakes, and in glaciers. This diagram shows a model for testing the idea of saturation. In A, there are some water molecules that have enough thermal energy to escape the water surface and evaporate. At the same time, there are some water molecules that lose energy and condense back to the surface. In B, when the number of molecules evaporating equal the number of molecules condensing, the air above the liquid is saturated. As we will see, this means that the relative humidity of the air above the water surface is 100%. Here are some other observations related to the balance between evaporation and condensation. Number one, wind generally enhances evaporation since the movement of air removes the evaporated water molecules from the surface. Two, Molecules in warm air have a higher thermal energy and therefore require less energy to evaporate. Therefore, water, warm water evaporates more readily than cool water. 3. Condensation is likely to occur as the air cools. This is because the water molecules are moving more slowly and likely to adhere to nuclei and form droplets. 4. No matter how low the air temperature, there's always some vapor present, water vapor present. 5. Air saturation is likely to occur in cooler air than warmer. That is, you need fewer water molecules escaping from the surface to maintain saturation. And finally, number 6. Warm air can hold more water vapor before saturation than cool air. Here is a humidity concept map I developed using a free tool called CMAP. CMAP is very easy to use and makes some nice concept maps. So, the bottom line from this scale is that humidity is a complex topic and laden with various terminology. I'd like to move through each major section, adding images from our reading. So here we go. First, here are the major terms from the chapter. Humidity is defined as the amount of water vapor in the air. It is measured and reported in at least five different ways. Absolute humidity, specific humidity, mixing ratio, vapor pressure, and relative humidity. Let's first look at absolute humidity. Absolute humidity is the mass of water vapor divided by the volume of air. So it is also known as the water vapor density because it is measured in mass per volume. Perhaps we have not stressed this yet, and we will soon, but as air parcels move around vertically in the atmosphere, they change volume because of the changing pressure. Lower in the atmosphere, there are more air molecules, and therefore the air pressure is higher. As an air parcel descends, the pressure increases. 
the volume decreases and the absolute humility increases. It is the opposite for ascending air. Volume increases and absolute humidity decreases. Because of this behavior, humidity as a measure, as measured as absolute humidity, is not used in atmospheric studies. Next, we will look at mixing ratio and specific humidity. Unlike the absolute humidity, which is affected by volume changes, both the mixing ratio and the specific humidity are ratios that are dependent on mass and not volume. The specific humidity is calculated as the mass of water vapor divided by the total mass of the air, including the water vapor. The units are grams per kilogram. The mixing ratio is the mass of water vapor divided by the mass of the remaining dry air and is also measured in grams per kilogram. Both the mixing ratio and the specific humidity increase with increasing water vapor. A conundrum related to these two humidity measures is that at polar latitudes the air has a lower specific humidity than areas at 30 degree latitudes which are the home to major deserts of the world. Hmm. Why is that? This relationship is shown on the next On this graph, the specific humidity is greatest at the equator and decreases towards higher latitudes. This means at 30 degrees latitude, the location of major deserts, the specific humidity is greater than at the poles. This seems odd since deserts are viewed as very hot and dry. They certainly are hot and we definitely know they're dry. We will see later that this is a function of other aspects of humidity and air temperature. Now let's look at the vapor pressure which is also related to another measure called the relative humidity. The total air pressure of a gas is the sum total of all the pressures of all gases. For humidity, the water vapor is related to the total number of water molecules. More water molecules, higher vapor pressure. When the air cannot take any more water molecules, it is saturated. And the vapor pressure is called the saturation vapor pressure. Vapor pressure is measured in pascals, millibars, or inches of mercury. The saturation vapor pressure is mainly a function of the temperature as shown in the next two slides. In this model, saturation is reached when the number of molecules escaping from the surface equals the number of molecules returning to the surface. At higher temperatures, you need more water vapor to saturate the air. This graph shows that relationship. As you increase temperature, the water vapor pressure also increases. For example, at 10 degrees centigrade, the vapor pressure is around 12 millibars. At 30 degrees centigrade, the saturation vapor pressure is at 42 millibars. Next up is the relative humidity, which is a very important measure and something we'll be using in our work with collecting data from our weather stations. This is both connected to the vapor pressure and yet another measure of humidity called the dew point. Relative humidity is the most common way to describe atmospheric moisture, but also the mis most mis misunderstood. The relative humidity tells us how close the air is to saturation, rather than a direct measure of the amount of water vapor. Relative humidity can be defined as the vapor, water vapor content divided by the water vapor capacity, or the actual vapor pressure divided by the saturation vapor pressure times 100. RH, or relative humidity, is a function of both 
temperature and pressure. Focusing on temperature, an increase in temperature causes a decrease in relative humidity because faster moving molecules are less likely con to condense. Condensation drives up the humidity. A decrease in temperature causes the relative humidity to increase. Slower moving molecules are more likely to condense and therefore drive up the relative humidity. Here's an application of relative humidity. If you live in a humid climate, that is not the arid areas of the west or other places, then you have experienced these changes in relative humidity with temperature. In the cool nights and mornings, the relative humidity is high. We experience that by having dew or fog. Whereas during the warmer part of the days, the relative humidity is low as the fog or dew burns off. Remember, this is primarily due to the fact that warmer air can hold more moisture than cool air. You can also change the relative humidity by changing the water vapor content. Or another way to say this, changing the wa vapor pressure. If you remove water vapor, the relative humidity goes down. If you add water vapor, the relative humidity goes up. Our next measure of humidity is the dew point. The dew point is defined at the temperature at which air needs to be cooled to condense, that is reach saturation. So when the air temperature and the dew point are the same, which is uncommon, the air is saturated. If air temperature is near the dew point, the relative humidity is high. Remember this means that the water vapor volume is near the capacity of the air for that temperature. If the air temperature does not equal or is far from the dew point, the relative humidity is low. We can also look at the dew point from the point of view of the actual water vapor content. High water vapor, high dew point is common along the Gulf Coast due to the humid air from the Gulf of Mexico that extends into the mid-continent and up the east coast during July, as shown here. That is why there's humid weather during these months. In January, the dew points are still fairly high along the Gulf Coast, but due to the cool air coming from the, the north, the mid-continent actually has a lower dew point. So this brings us back to the conundrum of polar air having a lower specific humidity than air at 30 degree latitude areas which are marked by deserts. Air at the poles is cold and the dew point temperature is close to the air temperature. This means that the relative humidity is close to 100%. That is, you don't have to cool the air very far for condensation to occur. But the total vapor content is low because the air is so cold. Desert air, on the other hand, is pretty high in water content because the temperature is high and because of the location closer to the equator. But the relative humidity is low and the dew point is far from the temperature as well. This is a visual that shows these relationships. Polar air equals low temperature, dew point temperatures close to the air temperature, and a relative high humidity. Desert air, high air temperature, big difference between the dew point and the air temperature, and a relatively low relative humidity. So desert areas feel dry because they have low relative humidity and not because they have low water vapor content. 
Let's put these ideas into a North American context during a July afternoon at 3 p.m. With apologies to non-North Americans, or those not living on the continent, the Gulf of Mexico air is warm and therefore results in higher water vapor concentrations. Onshore, this results in higher dew point temperatures and higher relative humidity. Therefore, this time of year can feel pretty miserable. On the west coast, Pacific waters are cooler and hold less water vapor. Air temperatures are still pretty high, but the dew point temperatures are not close to the air temperatures, resulting in a lower relative humidity. This leads to the common adage of dry heat, not feeling as oppressive. It has a relatively low relative humidity compared to those areas in the southeast. One last application. It is commonly thought <clears throat> that if it's raining the relative humidity is 100 percent. It may be 100 percent but only if the air is saturated which means that the dew point temperatures and the air temperatures are the same. In this image within the cloud where the rain forms the dew point temperature and air temperature are the same and the relative humidity is 100 percent. But closer to the ground the dew point temperatures and air temperatures are not the same and the relative humidity is lower, but still pretty high. Here is the humidity concept map again. So, humidity is a complex concept with a lot of terminology. I hope this lecture provides a good framework for understanding the concept of humidity. In general, we'll be most concerned with measures of relative humidity and dew point, which we hear a lot about on our weather forecasts. And we also use this measure on our weather, uh, these measures on our weather stations. We'll be doing some exercises with these two measures as well, but not so much work with vapor pressure or absolute humidity. But perhaps the best way to understand humidity is to experience it. So, get up, go travel to a tropical jungle, visit the steamy southeast during the summer, or go running during a humid day when the moisture attaches itself to you like plastic wrap. I also wonder if there's anyone who says, I really love humidity. <laughs>